Our conception of history in modern times is built around the idea that history is a written record. That wasn't always the case. It wasn't the case with the Africans, and early in the history of Europeans, it was not the case for them as well. Africans tell their history through word of mouth over generations, and the oral tradition becomes the chronicle of the lives of the people in the same way that the written word becomes the chronicle of Europeans. And the Africans become extremely skilled at recreating their history and handing it down from generation to generation. And this becomes for them as important a way of telling their lives through time as the written record is for Europeans. Everyone's past is central to their concept of themselves, central to their identity, and uh, central to how they are going to pass on their identity to their children. So a past is important, and the African past has been considered irretrievable because Africans, for the most part, came from an oral tradition. We know now that that is not true, that you can recover the past of people of African descent, beginning in Africa and going all the way through to America. And we can do that through the oral tradition, as well as through some of the written records that Africans themselves left once they learned to read and write, as well as reading through the lines of some of the records left by the Europeans when they encountered the Africans and when they enslaved them. In studying the history of people in America, I think the first thing you have to do is recognize that each group who came to America had a past and that that past impacted their history once they got to this country. One of the most exciting things about studying American history is the study of the convergence of various peoples and various cultures into a new land, into a land that none of them are familiar with, and how they create a new culture, how they interact, how they exploit each other, how they rise above that exploitation. It's the kind of history that I don't think any other nation has because it is a multicultural and diverse history in which people from various cultures have come together to create something that is completely new. A slave is a piece of property in objective terms. A slave is someone who is dominated by another person. A slave is someone who is essentially has no authority over their own person. And I think that the key word in enslavement is property. Uh, you have no life of your own as far as the person who owns you is concerned. All slavery from time immemorial has involved enslaving people who are different for one reason or another from you. And this was the case in Africa. This was the case in other parts of the world. So we know slavery is part of human experience. Slavery in the Americas was different because for one thing, it was based on race. For another, it was based on economics. And there was a sense that the enslaved people were not human. So that slavery in America developed an attitude around it which was designed to make everyone who was not enslaved feel that the natural condition of the people who were enslaved was bondage. American freedom has historically been tied to bondage. I think a bigger question is, did it always have to be that way? Can you have free people 
and at the same time have people who are unfree. And certainly I think that you can. Um, this was a society in which a small group of people felt that for whatever reason they themselves should be free and a larger group of people would be unfree. As to whether or not that is a situation in which people, that it's a natural concept of having free and unfree, I really don't think that is the case. I think that the concept of non-free has as its base the idea that you want to create an inequality so that one group or one individual can have more than the other. But freedom is something that uh, can be available to everyone unless you get in a situation where you want more than other individuals. And again, this is a, a process that is historical, not only in the United States or in America, but in other countries as well. Slavery and freedom did, existed side by side in this country. I think the issue is, did it always have to be that way? And the early history of America indicates that it probably did not. We have instances of Africans who, in the early period of Virginia and Carolina history, were servants, possibly slaves, but at some point in their lives were able to attain freedom, obtain land, and live as free people. Now, why couldn't that situation have been more pervasive? And I think the answer lies in the maximization of profit. And it became a system in which slavery would allow certain individuals more profit than a situation where freedom was pervasive. Equiano knows slavery. His family owned slaves. So he has some sense of what bondage would be like within his own environment, in his own world. So yes, he's very distraught. He's in despair over being captured and enslaved in Africa. But he has some sense of what bondage in Africa will mean for him as a boy. And over the period of months when he changes owners, we have a sense of what slavery in Africa was like. He is not treated badly, and in some situations, he is treated kindly. In one situation, he's made the companion of a son of a rich man and is treated very well, doing everything that the other children do in the family with the exception of eating at the table. As an enslaved child, he could not eat with the free people. But other than that, his life as a bond person, as a child in bondage, was very similar to that of the other children. So his concept of enslavement was one in which the enslaved people were human, the enslaved people worked right alongside with the people who owned them. Enslaved people, in some cases, could own property. They could aspire to higher status. So there was some flexibility in the system of bondage. That's what Equiano was familiar with. Equiano's narrative is a fascinating discussion of two kinds of bondage. It's a fascinating discussion of a child becoming a man in a situation of bondage. It's a fascinating discussion of a man who moves from an African world into an American world and then into an Atlantic world. And it gives us a sense of how cosmopolitan Equiano became. By the time he was in his early 20s, he was a free man. And we have a sense from Equiano of what was possible for an African if they had the kinds of opportunities that he had. Narratives like Equiano provide us with a first-hand account of what enslavement was like in Africa and a first-hand account of the Middle Passage, what that was like to be in the hold of a ship, the death, the desolation, 
It provides us with a first-hand account of the sale, the inspection that goes on when an individual is transferred from one trader to an owner. So it gives us a sense of the African world from an African point of view. And then it gives us a sense of what happens to an African when they come to America and the kinds of cultural exposures that they have, the kinds of desires that they have. Indeed, the effort to become American, which I think is, is part of Equiano's quest. He really does want to become part of this new world. If we didn't have a narrative of Equiano, would we have a history of what enslavement was like in Africa and what the early enslavement was like in America from an African perspective? And I guess a larger question would be then, would we have that early black history? And in some ways, we wouldn't have the firsthand account with the kind of intense detail which we get from Equiano. But I think we also have to always remember that Africans brought their history with them in their persons and that they passed on to their children what that life was like. So we might not have Equiano's written record, but we would have the oral record of the Africans. Each group probably, each ethnic group, probably has its own sense of what we call ethnocentrism. The Africans were probably no different from the Europeans in that sense. Equiano talks about his fear of the whites because of their long hair, because they were hairy people, and because of their skin. He had never seen people who looked this way. The Europeans were repulsed by the color of the Africans, especially the English. The Portuguese and the Spanish had the experience of Moorish Africa. The Moors were lighter skinned, but they were Africans. For the English, it was quite shocking to see people who were actually almost black. Um, and for them, that bespoke of a kind of inferiority. I think by the same token, the Africans were surprised uh, by the Europeans and by the way they looked and um, thought that they looked rather unfortunate. They talked about their red eyes, they talked about their hairiness, uh, almost animal looking. So each group brought their own prejudices to those early encounters. I think ethnocentrism and racism are different. You can look at your own ethnic group uh, in a more positive light than another ethnic group, but still not consider that ethnic group so far inferior that they deserve a different, let's say a lower socioeconomic status than you and your ethnic group. So I think that there is a difference between those two concepts. The first motivation for Europeans and Africans encountering each other was for trade. And that trade at first was in gold rather than human beings. It developed into a trade in humans when the Europeans began to settle in America, began to colonize, began to develop plantations, um, began to want to set up an economy that would allow them to accumulate large amounts of wealth. So one way of doing that was to create a planting, a plantation system in British, the British mainland. And the need for labor to create that kind of a system, a monocrop system, is what fueled the development of African slavery. The early relationships between the Europeans and the Africans was among elites, traders, priests, people who were very important in African society. And this relationship was essentially one between two equals, uh, two elites who wanted to get together for trade, in which the 
common people were caught as uh, the uh, people who were going to people America. These relationships are based on, as far as the Europeans are concerned, a desire to, to trade, first in gold and then textiles, uh, later in human cargo. For Africans, it's mainly wanting to get extras, not necessities. And it is a trade among elites in the Africa, between the Europeans and African elites. Because Europe is more technologically advanced than Africa, Africans are in a situation where they can get goods that they don't have. They can get guns. Um, they also want a different kind of textiles that they can get from the Europeans and bars, uh, a more sophisticated kind of iron. Nothing that is really essential to African culture or African survival or the African's economy. But it is something that they want. It is essentially a desire that they have to have European goods, which in some ways they consider superior to their own. Economically, this trade is not really benefiting Africa, but it is a trade that is controlled by the Africans. They're very careful not to allow Europeans into the interior. So they consider themselves the equal, and they're going to make sure that the Europeans do not infiltrate their land. The Atlantic slave trade was a very important process in speeding up the modernization of Western society. The trade opened up America. It created large plantations. It created a large profit system, agricultural profits, that was later able to be translated into commercial and industrial development. So the slave trade created a huge amount of profits, and those profits at first were agricultural and then later invested into industry as Europe began to develop technologically at a higher and higher level. Without the capital that came from the exploitation in America, they wouldn't have been able to do this. And without the African labor, they wouldn't have been able to do this. Most Africans are not really aware of what's happening globally, although some of them are. Some of those in West Central Africa, such as those in Congo, are in direct communication with Europe through the church. So some of them are sophisticated enough to know what's going on. Equiano gives us probably our most vivid firsthand account from an African of what is happening to Africans on the ships in that passage, that passage we call the Middle Passage. The despair, the anguish is something that he writes about. And even more significantly, I think, is the bonding that takes place. And it's a kind of bonding that, at the time it's happening, no one is probably aware of because they're in such despair. Um, but something is going on in the holds of the ships when Africans of various cultures from various language groups, various classes, are put in an identical situation, and there is no elite, and uh, everyone is being tortured in this situation. And it creates a kind of bonding that is probably the first step toward the development of a sense of peoplehood that becomes African American. Equiano is our mirror into the despair, the desolation, the stench, the death, the fact that people are unable to stand, that there's probably two or three feet between the top of the ship and a person's head. Um, we get a sense of what incredible terror the Africans were experiencing through the eyes of Equiano. Africans 
being brought to the coast were different peoples. They were African, they were dark-skinned, they had some cultural similarities over geographical regions, but they saw themselves as individual groups of people. They saw themselves as probably not having that much in common, which is one reason enslavement in Africa took the form which it did, because it was a kind of enslavement in which people who were captured were different, and so they could be captured and they could be held in a kind of bondage because they were not part of that lineage. So they saw themselves uh, as unique people from each ethnic group, not in the sense that Europeans saw them. Europeans grouped them together aggregately. That is not the way they saw themselves. The Wolof were different from the Bambara. The Golas were different from the Timni. So, each group had its own identity. That's one of the first things they lost as a result of the Middle Passage. The Middle Passage is a bonding experience, and it is the important experience in uniting various African ethnic groups, because it's something they all go through, and they arrive in the New World having those who survived, and, and many did not. But first of all, the first thing that united them was the experience and the fact that they survived that experience. So that, in a sense, was the beginning of the formation of Africans as people, African-American people. So the Middle Passage was that kind of a passage. In some ways, it was a rite of passage for those who were able to endure it and it bound them because it was the first signifier of their common oppression. Of course, most of the Africans really had no sense of Europeans. Most of them had never seen Europeans. Equiano is probably our best example of the fear that the Africans had of the Europeans and of what was to come in this experience. He thinks he's going to be eaten uh, when he sees a huge kettle boiling, and he's relieved when he is told that he isn't going to be eaten, uh, that he is simply going to a country to work. Equiano is a boy, and so he is allowed on occasion to roam about the ship, as children and women often were. So from him we get a sense of the inequity, even in European society and his concept of what Europeans are and who they are sort of matures on this journey because he sees the treatment of the sailors, um, the floggings, the fact that even Europeans are brutal not only to Africans, but they're brutal to each other. So he gets a more sophisticated sense of European society on this voyage. When they arrive, in the New World, they are prepared for sale. The first thing they want to do is shave their heads um, for sanitary reasons and also probably because that way no one can tell their age because there will be no gray hair. And, and they prepare them for sale, feed them uh, in a far better way than they're fed on the voyage because they want them to look sleek and uh, healthy for the sale. So, this whole process of selling is another trauma for the Africans. The inspection, the uh, process of being looked at all over your body, and, and then being taken away. That process also involves being separated. It's another separation from the people with whom you have bonded during the Middle Passage. So it's another break in their consciousness of who they are because they have bonded during the Middle Passage, that is going to be broken and then they're going to be taken someplace else and then, of course, once again, another kind of bonding is going to take place. We're not really sure where these early Africans came from. They were on mostly Dutch ships, some Portuguese ships, so they probably were from 
the central part of West Africa, that would mean that they were Congolese or from the Angolan region. So, and, and in the process of going from Africa, they probably stopped at the Caribbean and from there came to Virginia. Usually the Virginia Africans were people whom the Caribbeanists did not want. So they probably were individuals who had been exposed to several cultures before they got to Virginia. And, and that was another exposure. They probably had not heard English in the early years and uh, may have spoken Portuguese and may have spoken French, may have spoken Spanish, and once again had to adjust to another language. One of the early Africans coming to Virginia, Antonio, who was later called Anthony Johnson, gives us a sense of this. His name was initially recorded as Antonio, so we know that he was probably given that name either by Spanish or Portuguese people. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that Antonio was from the Congo and may have been baptized even by a Congolese priest, which they did on the coast of the Congo and gave him that uh, Latinized name. So there are various ways in which the early African Virginias arrived in the British mainland. As far as early Africans were concerned, they were better off in Virginia than in some of the Caribbean or the Spanish colonies because in the early years, Virginia had not yet developed the repressive kind of slave system that it would have in the future. It also, in the early years, had not really developed that monocrop, that tobacco crop, although it was emerging uh, the way it had uh, would in the future. And Africans coming in might have the opportunity of becoming indentured servants as opposed to enslaved people. Africans would be coming into a colony on the British mainland, one of the new colonies, essentially into a wilderness. Wild animals, uh, undeveloped land, thick woods, very rudimentary housing, a colony that really had not developed yet. We're talking 1619, 1620. Virginia has only been in existence about a decade, so it's very raw. And the African labor would be essential to that, but the African labor would be, and the African position would be developing right along with the colony. So in one sense, there probably isn't a fixed status for Africans coming into this frontier situation of Virginia. Survival has to be the most important criteria in a frontier colony so that these fine distinctions that come to be made between black and white are really not there yet. Uh, that isn't to say the seeds are not there, but they can't be played out because people depend on each other too much. Antonio is fortuitous in a lot of ways. I mean, fortuitous as a bond person who ends up in Virginia fortuitous in the sense that he ends up on the Bennett Plantation and that in this massacre in which 52 of the 60 people are killed by the Indians, he survives. Something must have happened on that plantation uh, that explains his future success. Possibly Antonio saved the life of a Bennett since they play such an important role in his future success, his financial success, his status in Virginia. They're there and they are people who are very prominent in Virginia later on. So on this plantation with the Indian uprising, Antonio may have been in a situation where he saved the life of a Bennett or someone very prominent and um, that gave him a position of importance and later on probably was responsible for him getting his freedom, his wife's freedom, and his acquisition of land, and later on his acquisition of slaves himself. Early Virginia gives us a sample of a way in which 
the colony could have developed differently from the manner in which it did. Because the situation is fluid, because it is frontier, because there is so much interdependency, it did not have to develop into a plantation economy. The seeds were there for the development of a colony that had far more equanimity than it developed. Enslavement was not a foregone conclusion in early Virginia. And given the relationships between blacks and whites in early Virginia, one can see, and I probably Antonio is our shining example of this, one can see that there was some cooperation, that there were levels of understanding, and there was a situation in which the word of an African meant something. On the other hand, it's important to keep in mind that Virginia was a colony of Great Britain, and Great Britain was a superpower, and Great Britain wanted its colonies to provide profit for the mother country. And given that larger situation, it's difficult to believe that Virginia could have actually developed into a colony of uh, free Africans and free white people. Virginia becomes very heavily engaged in tobacco. Tobacco is a crop that needs a tremendous amount of laborers, far more laborers than the Virginians were able to get from Great Britain. The supply of Africans in this colonial era seemed insatiable and the African merchants and traders were willing to provide the Europeans with as many laborers as they needed. So why bother with indentured servants who after seven, 18, or 21 years, if they lived that long, you were going to have to free them when you could have Africans serve their lifetime and serve in perpetuity through their children. You can't discount the notion that black and white servants and slaves were going to unite over their oppression, their common oppression. We have evidence of them running away together. We have evidence of them rising against their masters together. They lived together. They slept together. So yes, there was a possibility of a lower class surge against the elites. So that's a very important consideration for the Virginians in terms of wanting to create one kind of labor force. Virginia does not develop its slave codes until the 1660s. However, de jure codes do not tell the entire story. And if you look at some of the information on early Virginia in the court cases, you can see that whites, for instance, are punished for having sex with Negro women. If, even though slavery has not been codified, if Africans are not considered different, then why do you whip people for sleeping with Africans? Other instances of white women who take up with black men having their indenture extended seven years, these kinds of codes are in the books, and this happens before the 1660 law which codifies slavery. So we know in early Virginia, blacks are perceived as different. We know that not all Africans in early Virginia, even among those who came first in 1619, were classed as slaves. Some of them were indentured servants. But the process of moving from indentured servitude to enslavement was something that was open to Africans as opposed to being open to white indentured servants. Examples would be white and black indentured servants fleeing together, and then when they're caught, the African indentured servant being made to serve for life, whereas the white indentured servant would have their servitude increased, maybe seven years, rather than being able to serve for life. So we know that there is a difference already, even before the codes are actually on the books.
The presence of Africans in large numbers in Virginia was certainly alarming after those early years because of labor, also because these colonies were established for Europeans, not to create a situation of multiracial society. And once the black and white servants began to mingle and live together, intermarry, this created an unstable situation in the colony as far as the elite were concerned. They did not want to create a multicultural society, a multiracial society. They wanted a society that was going to maximize their profits. So it was really incumbent upon them as their black population increased to make sure that there was a break between black and white, even on the servant level. So the slave codes solidified that, uh, and it was really necessary as the colony grew, say, by 1660, 1670, that Africans be relegated to a specific status that was below whites, even below white indentured servants. So in this way, they obliterated or attempted to obliterate any sense of uniformity between black and white servants. Once you develop slave codes that are based on skin color, on blackness, then you separate black and white serving people with blacks being at the bottom and white serving people being one echelon above them. So that creates a kind of codified difference based specifically on race. The difference, the sense of difference, is always there. That doesn't mean it's based on race. That doesn't mean it's racism. The codification of enslavement in the 1660s really sort of represents the beginning of probably modern racism because the laws are designed to relegate people of African descent to enslavement in perpetuity on the basis of their being African. So what that means is that an indentured servant and a black person, a black slave, are no longer equals even in terms of labor because the African is not only laboring for his or her life, but whatever, who, whatever they produce. Their children are going to be laborers. So the indentured servant knows that after 21 years, seven years, they will be free. The African will never be free. So this creates a standard of difference that is legal, and it creates a cultural sense among lower class whites that no matter how degraded they are, they are not as degraded as a black person. And the natural order for people of African descent is bondage. This also creates problems for Africans who are free, with the status being set on the basis of race. So racism not only affects Africans who are enslaved, but it affects those who are free as well. And I think that you really do have to date the beginning of modern racism with these codifications based on skin color. Anthony Johnson's situation probably gives us a significant window into early racial attitudes and into the development of racism. When he is in a situation where he wants to retrieve his own slave, because he is a slave owner himself, his family counsels him not to go to court over this issue, not to confront a white man. And Johnson agrees with that. He acquiesces in that, even though he feels very uncomfortable, because in a class situation, he is the equal of this man. But his family recognizes that he's a black man and he should not confront this white man in court. And Johnson is agreeable to this, but perplexed by it to the point where later on, he does go to court and he wins. But I think that his situation is an anomaly. It's not the norm. But the fact that his family does not want him to do this, they do not want him to confront the white man in the white man's court gives us a sense of the deteriorating conditions for people of African descent in Virginia.
In the early years, as Anthony Johnson is accumulating property, it seems as though his situation is secure because even when he loses his home, it's burned down, his wife and daughters are given free white woman status. So you get a sense of this individual, this black man, being treated like any white planter and his wife and daughters being treated like the wife of a planter, like a plantation mistress. But I think that his reluctance to confront the court in this situation of slaveholding indicates that his status is changing and the fact that this individual Parker feels that he can successfully take away Anthony Johnson's enslaved man indicates that the system is breaking down for even Africans with property. The interesting thing about the Johnsons naming their farm Angola later on is the cross between two worlds that seems to be evident and it's our probably our one clue into this cross, but it's a very important clue because this is years later. Antonio comes in 1621. This is his son who names his farm Angola. So clearly Antonio, i.e. Anthony, has been talking to his children about his African background, his African roots. And in spite of the fact that he has become a property owner and a planter and a slaveholder, that is, he has become Europeanized in that sense, in the economic sense, culturally, he still clings to his African roots. The Johnson situation is probably an example of what will happen as Africans become Americans. This is an early example, and the process itself is really not going to take place for some time because there are too many Africans coming in too fast for them to really acculturate. But it gives us an example of the duality that is going to be the future of Africans in America because they do straddle the fence. They straddle the fence culturally in some cases because they're kept out of white society, but in other cases because they want to keep their own culture. And economically, because they're essentially the mainstay of the colony. The Anglican missionaries probably described the black community better than anyone at the time in early Carolina. They described it as a nation within a nation in which the Africans lived in contiguous housing separated from the rest of society. So from that we get a sense of Africans living in village form away from whites because they were the pioneers, they were the people going into this wilderness to cultivate it, to cut down the trees for the tar and the pitch and the turpentine. These were the people who were doing the work and they lived amongst themselves. They certainly didn't live in wooden slave cabins as the 19th century African-American bonds people did. Being freshly from Africa, their frame of reference was African. So we know from archeological digs that they built huts made out of clay and covered on top of clay with uh, palmetto leaves and they tried to replicate an African village. They also slept on mats which they themselves made from the rushes and the palmetto leaves that uh, they found around them. And they found the environment of Carolina similar to their African experience. Very wild, the uh, forests were thick alligators and they were accustomed to that because of the crocodiles. Uh, so you find a lot of Africans, unlike the Europeans, going into the water with knives in their mouths to actually fight uh, alligators and sharks. So they were very much familiar with this kind of subtropical environment that they found themselves in in Carolina.
In some ways, the Europeans in Carolina were far more dependent on the Africans than vice versa. South Carolina was a colony that was settled specifically to create uh, a planting system of some kind. And uh, it was, unlike Virginia, started with Africans by Barbadian gentry. So when it developed, it developed African slavery right along with it. And before long, Africans were the majority. Africans settled the region with the Europeans, and then they spread out. Whereas the Europeans stayed in the towns, the Africans were sent out to, to cultivate, to cut down trees, to build first their homes, and then, once they had built their own homes, then to build wooden structures for the Europeans. So they were very important in that sense. They were important in the sense that up until about 1720, they also served in the militia. So they fought Indians for the Europeans, sometimes alongside the Europeans. They had guns, they could hunt, uh, they had a lot of autonomy. And of course, they were the mainstay in terms of the skilled occupations in Carolina. Carpenters, coopers, sawyers, blacksmiths. Some of the skills the Africans brought with them from Africa. They had charge of the waterways. The women were very important in the marketing. So it was, as one traveler said, a Negro country. Jimmy the Rebel is African, uh, probably far more African than Carolinian, but we have no idea how old he was when he came to the colony, but we do know that uh, he was either Congolese or Angolan, and that as the leader of the rebels, his cohort group, were all Angolan, some 20 or so. So how does someone like that emerge in the black community, the early black community? He emerges probably as a leader, may have been a leader, may have come from a leadership family in Africa, may have been able to read Portuguese, and in the process of reading Portuguese, probably could read Spanish. Uh, people say that Spanish and Portuguese are like Scottish and English. And so he had some skills, some cultural skills that were European. At the same time, his sense of himself, his sense of identity, and his sense of community was African. Africans in early Carolina were far more cosmopolitan than we realize. Some of them were bilingual, some were even trilingual. Some of them, having been born in Africa, which in the region they were from, the Congo-Angolan region, had a lot of Europeans, were familiar with European culture. They knew that the Spanish were in Florida. So they could also, some of them, read and write. Some of the Anglican missionaries said after Stono that some of the rebels, the leaders, were much indulged slaves, whom they themselves had taught to read and write. So the Africans had a level of literacy and knowledge that made them aware of what was going on outside of the colony. Also, because of the fact that they were pioneers, they went all over Carolina. And this, along with the fact that they had Hispanic elements in their culture, made them aware of the possibilities of freedom. African slavery in Carolina in the early decades of Carolina was diverse. Africans did all kinds of labor, skilled, semi-skilled, unskilled. Also, they were in charge of the waterways, which was a major network of communication. Some of them worked on ships, so they would transport information from the Caribbean to the Carolinas, from the lower part of the South to the upper part. So they had their own network of communication. Given the fact that the Europeans depended on them so much, they couldn't keep them ignorant. This combination of 
networking through the waterways, which was the primary means of transportation, along with the diversity of their labor and the autonomy that comes with diverse labor, they had a tremendous amount of knowledge about what was going on in the world outside of Carolina. One has to ask for an African in Carolina trying to get to freedom, what is freedom? What did it mean to them? We know that the Africans who comprised the Stono Uprising carried banners, and the banners said liberty. So we know that they had a concept of what liberty and what freedom meant. They were on their way to St. Augustine because of the signs specifically that the Spanish had posted offering liberty to any British slaves who got that far. So Florida represented freedom, but also in Florida were independent black communities as well, so we don't have to think of them as going to the Spanish. We have to expand our concept of what they thought of as liberty, and it did not necessarily mean going to St. Augustine to be with the Spanish. It could mean setting up their own communities in uh, Florida. It could mean setting up another community in South Carolina. But it did mean getting away from Europeans and living on their own. The region called Angola really was a region in West Central Africa that began in the Congo region and then went all the way down to present day Angola. So it was a large region and when the British, especially during the time of Stono, referred to Angolans, they were referring to a region. And most of the Africans who came to South Carolina during this time were probably from Congo, which was part of that Angolan region. But for Europeans, this was Angola. And uh, actually, Angola was farther down. But for them, it represented a kind of slave. And it depended on what period in history that we're talking about as to what the Europeans thought of Angolans. Before Stono, they preferred these so-called Angolans because they said they were docile uh, and they made good laborers. After Stono, they don't want any more Angolans because they're rebels. So they have really mythical attitudes about various Africans. Stono actually could have been predicted in South Carolina. They had ample evidence that something was going to happen. As they began to tighten the screws on slavery, as they began to divest Africans of their autonomy and to take skilled Africans and put them in the rice fields, to take away whatever vestiges of opportunity that they had, Africans began to react in groups, robberies, poisonings, and so on. Uh, so they knew that something was going to happen. But Stono is important because it changed the face of slavery in Carolina and had ramific ramifications for other colonies as well. It solidified slavery in a way that it hadn't been before and probably would have happened anyway, but Stono was a catalyst. And it created a sense that they had to have a population of Africans who were American born. They largely blamed this rebellion on the fact that the Africans were African as opposed to being Negro, that is, born in America. So the first thing they wanted to do was cut off the trade. And they did that for 10 years. And uh, of course, economics dictated that they would open it up again. The interesting thing about opening it up again is that they began to import, for the most part, different ethnic groups a long way from the Congo-Angolan region. And this fed into their whole mythology about which Africans make the best servants, when in fact it was probably dictated by the economic needs and the fact that the Africans whom they imported were familiar with what they were going to cultivate on a massive scale, which was rice. So Stono was 
sort of the beginning of the development of large-scale slavery in South Carolina and the concept that the black population had to be utterly controlled. And the legislation that came out of Stono, the Negro Act, took away whatever liberties the Africans had, and even those liberties that they didn't have, which the planters allowed them anyway, even though it was breaking the law, all of those things were rescinded. The Europeans developed preferences for certain Africans from ethnic groups, and they developed an attitude that certain Africans had certain characteristics that were either important to the economy or to the colony, or detrimental to it. Angolans before Stono were considered the best Africans because they were docile, they made good servants. The Igbo were never liked in Carolina, for instance. Lawrence writes about uh, not wanting Oswald, his traitor, to send him Igbo because they destroy themselves. The Wolof, uh, the Carolinians liked because they said they looked more like Europeans. They were tall and they had sharp features and they had long hair. Uh, they liked the Mandingo, although they were hard to get because they were also the traders, uh, because they were considered muscular and big. Um, in fact, what they preferred had to do with what they could get, especially in Carolina because the West Indian planters were going to get first choice because of sugar. It also had a lot to do with what they were cultivating. And when the Europeans in Carolina began to cultivate rice, then they began to uh, import on a massive scale Africans from what they call the Grain Coast or the Rice Coast. And, um, and then they developed a whole list of characteristics about these Africans that uh, fit their own ethnocentrism. After Stono, the trade was ceased for 10 years. Once it began, the Carolinians insisted that they get no more Angolans because the Angolans had gone from being the Africans who were the best servants because they were the most docile to the most hated because they were the most rebellious. So it gives you a sense of how ridiculous this whole idea of uh, African preference was. The Stono era, and I think it can be uh, discussed as an era, was a period of massive importations. Uh, it was also a period of rising expectations as far as the Africans were concerned, repression as far as the whites were concerned, uh, and rebellion. And once St Stono was sort of part of a continuum, there was the massive rebellion in Antigua in 1737 and then Stono, and there was the New York Conspiracy of 1741. It seemed as though in these places where there was a large concentration of Africans uh, and the screws were being tightened on them more that they began to resist, and it created a fear that evolved into for instance, in the New York conspiracy, total paranoia to the point where, whereas in Stono, you had a large number of whites killed uh, in an actual rebellion. To this day, we don't know whether there ever really was a conspiracy in New York City in 1741. We do know that countless numbers of Africans were burned uh, and hanged uh, and their heads put on posts. Uh, so there was this incredible reaction perhaps not even so much to the New York conspiracy as to what had happened in other places. And reacting to that, they decided that if there wasn't a conspiracy, they were gonna behave as though it was just to let the Africans know that they better behave. The process is sort of a circuitous one. The Africans come at first in small numbers, then in larger numbers, they become more and more important to the economy, but their situation as individual laborers becomes more and more repressed, and the Europeans hedge them in more, they resist that hedging in. And the more they resist, and the more important they become to the economy, 
then the more the Europeans repress them, create laws, hedge them in, and the Africans react by rebelling. And the whites are in total fear, and rather than create a situation where there is some breathing room for the Africans, some autonomy, they react to the Africans' resistance and rebellion by tightening more and more. And of course, the more they tighten, the more the Africans rebel. The freedom of movement is curtailed uh, for Africans. Their ability to buy and sell is curtailed. And these things are important to them. It's important to their sense of themselves as people. Uh, they're slaves physically, and they know that. But they're still communities of people who live, love, raise children, and work. And they feel that as people, as humans, as individuals, that they have a right to certain gratuities. They have a right to come and go. They have a right to visit their wives and their husbands on other plantations. They have a right to sell the goods that they produce on their own little lots in the markets. So as the labor force increases, the colonists decrease the amount of autonomy which the Africans have, which the Africans feel that they are entitled to. And, and this creates a conflict when they decide that the Africans can no longer sell their goods in the market, that they can no longer buy from the market, when they are not allowed to go into taverns, which was a, a very important place where they went uh, and sold goods um, and uh, also drank and socialized. When they stopped these kinds of human activities, communal activities, then the Africans began to feel that the system was far too oppressive, uh, even as slaves, that there was no flexibility whatsoever for them. And um, also, of course, there was the issue of religion. The Anglicans had attempted to bring Christianity to the Africans, and this was a bone of contention between the missionaries and the planters who wanted none of this. Uh, Africans had their own religious purview, which was non-Christian in, in many important ways. On the other hand, Christianity represented another form of autonomy for them. It meant they could get away from the plantations. It meant that uh, they might be baptized, and baptism to them meant a kind of spiritual freedom that some of them translated into actual freedom. So these kinds of uh, repressive measures on the part of the colonists made the Africans more determined than ever to resist. And they resisted not only in terms of Stono, they resisted by running away, they robbed. Um, many people, Europeans traveling the highways of Carolina, would often comment on the fact that uh, the roads were full of vagrant Africans, sometimes pulling them off of their horses and taking their horses and robbing them. So the Africans were in a state of upheaval, essentially. One of the most important methods by which the Africans felt hedged in was the freedom of movement. Africans were accustomed to going from place to place when they were not laboring. They were accustomed to having the Sundays off to visit wives, uh, husbands, and children on Sundays, uh, or to go to the grog shops on Sundays. So human activity that represented family formation and community development were essential to their concepts of themselves as people, even though they were in bondage. They liked festivals. Uh, they liked to get together and dance. These kinds of activities as a community were extremely important to them. So when the Europeans curtailed that freedom of movement, because as far as they were concerned, any time any more than three Africans gathered together, they were fomenting a conspiracy. Um, when in fact, in a lot of cases, they were simply getting together, uh, having a sense of community. But to the Europeans, this was uh, 
part of their paranoia. And so their efforts to suppress this kind of normal community development was something that the Africans were not going to tolerate, and they began to resist in individual as well as communal ways. And uh, this is especially important when they began to import more Africans after the moratorium following Stono, uh, because once again, you have this population of people who were born on another continent and uh, are completely unfamiliar with this kind of bondage and they are often on the run. Fires are an important form of resistance for Africans. They are in Carolina and they are in New York. And when you have a town in which one fire can cause the entire town to burn down, then there's cause for concern. And Africans traditionally have resisted by starting fires. Uh, they start the fire so that the Europeans will run to the fire to try and put it out, and then they will begin the business of rising. Sometimes that means getting as many Africans as you can together and getting the Europeans in a group and descending on them. Other times it means this is a way to get to the arsenal and the powder uh, while the Europeans are busy with the fire. So the fires become a tactic for Africans uh, as well as a form of destruction. The fires, the suspected arson in 1741 is perceived as having been started by the enslaved population because the New Yorkers are remembering the incidents of earlier times, the 1712 rebellion in which Africans did actually start fires in order to lure Europeans away so that they could begin the business of rebelling and rising. So when the fires began in New York in 1741, New Yorkers automatically assumed that these were started in the same manner and was a way in which the Africans were trying to get them to be concerned so they could start their rebellion. So they were remembering what had happened in the past, and that largely explains their paranoia as a result of the 1741 conspiracy. We don't know that there was a conspiracy. Some people said there was. We have uh, white uh, evidence that there was a conspiracy, but there's no actual hard and fast evidence that there was, even though Many Africans lost their lives and were accused of conspiring. And it was primarily based on this rash of fires that happened in New York. The fact that the conspiracy or the tie, tying of Africans to a conspiracy in New York hedged on the testimony of a white female servant speaks to the lack of any real effort to get at the truth of what was happening in 1741. And there were probably a lot of other issues going on in New York City at that time that made whites suspicious of blacks. There was, among the lower classes of blacks and whites, a lot of racial amalgamation. There was a lot of activity in the grog shops between blacks and whites, blacks frequenting taverns. New York City was a cosmopolitan place with people from various ethnic groups converging, lots of seamen. So there was this lower class culture from various ports, not only in America, but in Europe and in the Caribbean, coming together. Uh, and blacks were very much a part of that. This kind of cultural mixing was frightening to New Yorkers because it spelled egalitarianism and it was cross-racial, and it would undermine a system based on race slavery. The New York conspiracy in 1741 really speaks to the separation of blacks and whites, and I think speaks to the longevity of slavery in not only in uh, the South, but in New York itself because 1741 is not that too far from the period of the American Revolution, and yet New Yorkers are so incensed over 
what they conceive of as a conspiracy, that they create this wave of, of paranoia that leads to incredible murders and incredible punishments. So it speaks to the whole entrenchment of slavery, even in the North, and also it speaks to racial attitudes as well, that they are very much afraid of racial egalitarianism and people in the lower echelons of their society coming together to form any kind of bond. Certainly the first and second generation of people of African descent in the British mainland are no longer African. They're not American either. They're probably more African than anything else on the one hand. On the other hand, as they're developing this new culture and acclimating themselves to this new culture and certainly losing aspects of their old culture, they're probably in a period of fluidity as far as what they're going to become. They have not been accepted into American society and they cannot go back. So they are in some ways in kind of a limbo and I think Equiano is an example of that when he meets another enslaved person whom he doesn't know but who immediately embraces him and recognizes him as someone from his own country. Then you get a sense of how far Equiano has traveled from his own roots. Uh, that while he's certainly not uh, an American, he has lost some of his Africanity and that's something that uh, he can't retrieve. The experience of enslavement and the change that comes from it begins with the Middle Passage. I think that's the beginning of the departure and from what they were before. And that continues as they experience various kinds of enslavement and racism so that even inside of themselves, they're not the same. They are certainly not African, but they are, they are Mer American and not really part of a society which they have come to call home. And uh, it's an important paradox that uh, the Africans are no longer Africans and they are not really Americans. And yet they are looking toward America while keeping as much of their Africanness as they can. It seems as though they are looking toward America for a future. And that plays itself out as uh, the country moves toward revolution. During the rebellions, Stono, um, for example, the Africans are as brutal as the Europeans, but they have been brutalized. And in a sense, brutality begets brutality. So the Africans are going to show the Europeans no mercy because the Europeans have shown them none. And it does speak to how slavery can dehumanize people in terms of how they see other people. For Europeans, Africans in America are the other. And for Africans, Europeans are the other. And in that sense, just as Europeans feel that they can treat Africans any way they want to, Africans react to that by, once they begin a rebellion, killing everybody. And they do that. They kill men, women, and children. One has, have, you have to keep in mind, however, that especially in Stono, they spared a tavern keeper. Why did they spare him? Because he was kind to his slaves. So one has to say that even in the midst of rebellion, there was an element of humanism among the Africans. Uh, those who treated them fairly, they left alone. And uh, the others whom they knew nothing about or had evidence were slaveholders and were harsh, they simply killed. So there is a, an element of brutality in the sense that there's wanton killing. But when there's knowledge that someone is kind, then they leave them alone. But it's a brutal system. It's a brutal world. The first colony in the British mainland was 
established in 1607 in Virginia. The first Africans to come to the British mainland came in 1619. We know that at least some of them were enslaved, and we also know that out of those 20 Africans who came developed a system of racial slavery that lasted for many generations. So we can't understand American society in this period without understanding that slavery and freedom went hand in hand. And the irony about that is that when you enslave a person, in some ways you become a slave yourself because masters and slaves are natural enemies. And an enslaved person is going to find any way he or she can to be free, however they perceive freedom. And that's what the Europeans had to deal with. They had to deal with a population living amongst them, sometimes the majority of the population, in hostility. They lived amongst enemies. And as one Carolina planter said, nowhere on earth is mankind so plagued by enemies living within them as we are in our own homes. Of course, slavery didn't have to develop. It was a system that was propelled by economic motivation, by profit, and plain and simply by greed. So, no, it didn't have to develop in the British colonies, but there was a larger system that made profit the center, and the British mainland was part of that. Indeed, the larger system fed on that kind of, of uh, development. So within that system, slavery was extremely important. And it developed because individuals wanted more. And the more they got, the more they wanted. And they did this at the expense of another population doing the labor. And the population did the labor, and they did it well. And the better they did it, the more entrenched the system. And the more entrenched the system, the more slavery kept African Americans down. So the, the level of prosperity that the British mainland accomplished was based on a system of bondage, and it perpetuated itself. Africans were efficient workers. They were good workers. They were hard workers. They were workers who were forced under very oppressive circumstances to do this labor, but they did it nevertheless, and it created unparalleled prosperity and riches, and the system itself was based on that kind of greed. By 1750, slavery is integral to the South. South Carolina has a majority of African Americans. Virginia has a huge amount of African Americans. The South is a slave region, and the entire economy is dependent on slave labor. By 1750, slavery is an integral part of the colonial economy in the North and especially in the South. Slaves are the most important form of wealth. The next important form of wealth is land, and the two go together because the slaves work the land. The more land you have, the more slaves you have, the more profit uh, you can accrue. So slavery is part of that system, and to be a slave owner is to be a member of the elite. To be a non-slaveholder is to be essentially a small farmer or a poor white. So slavery determines your status in colonial uh, America. Because to work in the South was to be black, Africans controlled the labor, and that included women as well as men. Women's form of autonomy in South Carolina, African American women, was through the market system. Because they did the buying for the family, because they sold in the market, they had essentially sort of a community uh, that had some economic aspects to it. Uh, it gave them a sense of being able to 
have some control over themselves. And as far as the white community was concerned, it meant that this was something that they didn't have to deal with, this kind of uh, domestic aspect of, of uh, life. So it represented the whole market scene, which where food was bought and sold, represented for Africans a form of autonomy. And for whites, it was an area that they didn't want anything to do with. Now later on, whites begin to realize that this market situation controlled by women becomes a means of communication and networking for African Americans, sometimes for resistance purposes. So gradually, they begin to tighten the screws on the privileges that they have allowed the African women to have in the marketplace. When the Stamp Act crisis emerges and the Charlestonians are involved in protest and beginning this pamphlet war and this rhetoric about liberty and them being treated as slaves by Great Britain, quite naturally, the real slaves are going to pick up on this. And as a reaction to that, African Americans began to protest themselves and began to assess, as they have always done, a situation that might be an opportunity for liberty. So they pick up on this rhetoric of no representation and being taxed, of wanting liberty and having their liberty taken away. And of course, if anyone has their liberty taken away, it's them. So the African Americans are very much aware of what's going on and begin to protest as well as uh, other kinds of resistance. They look for avenues of resistance. And when this crisis begins in 1765, African Americans are not only protesting, but they're also involved in other kinds of resistance, looking for openings in the system. The, uh, things that happen after that from 1765 until the actual Lexington and Concord confrontation represents sort of a march for African Americans toward further assertion of their own sense of liberty. And it's oftentimes preceded by what they see the whites doing that indeed if whites can protest for their liberty, then they, as people who are the truly enslaved, have a right to protest for theirs. In a situation like Charleston, where there are so many African Americans compared to the white population, so many African Americans who are central to the economy, it's a very dangerous situation. And the colonists realize that, and they're constantly writing each other, talking about it, Enslaved people are sometimes executed for what they consider to be tests of their position as bonds people. There's a situation of a couple who hear about the Mansfield-Somerset decision in Britain in 1772, and they immediately flee because they're going to try to get to Britain because they have heard that Africans in Britain are free. So. The colonists react to this by, as they historically have reacted, and that is they repress the Africans. And as they repress the Africans, the Africans look for other opportunities. So Carolina itself, and Charleston in particular, because it's an urban center with a huge black population who do all of the labor, is in a way kind of in a state of internal siege. African Americans don't sit idly by while the whites are murdering and doing all kinds of things to curtail their freedom. Sometimes they simply pay no attention to these laws and continue to ignore curfews. They rob, they become highwaymen. Some of them run away, run to the Indians. They know that the nation, the colonies are in turmoil, and that the situation of enslavement is somewhat insecure. Uh, were it not, the whites would not feel so incumbent to create these situations of repression. So their reaction, the African American reaction, is to resist. And they resist by fleeing, they resist by 
ignoring curfews. Uh, they become very belligerent sometimes to whites in the streets. So they know that something is afoot and that there may be an opportunity for them. And of course the British, even before Dunmore's proclamation, even in the early 1770s, are writing each other and writing to England saying that if the colonists continue, then we know that we can certainly get their slaves to rise up against them. So African Americans are so integral to the economy that they know everything, they see everything, and they hear everything, and they react to that. Ideas about liberty are everywhere. They're in the streets, they're certainly in the home. Conversations are not private. Masters and mistresses talk about freedom as they're being served by their slaves. Women are coming in with dishes listening to this conversation. They know that there's a lot of controversy over various issues that come up among the colonists. So this itself creates a tension within a domestic context so that you have, for instance, slave women who are working in the home and uh, become impudent when they confront their mistresses over something minor. Probably before the agitation for revolution had occurred, when there was a conflict, the women would back down. But with this talk of liberty in the air that was being espoused by blacks as well as whites, it created a certain surliness, a certain assertiveness that played itself out in the home and it played itself out with women talking back to their mistresses. It played itself out with poisonings, um, with flight, with indignities that uh, they previously would have ignored, mushrooming. So people were looking for ways to assert themselves. And women were doing this in the home. The interesting thing about the Jeremiah situation was that he was considered a trusted black. And whites couldn't understand why he had betrayed them. And that speaks to the white capacity for self-deception, to feel that Africans whom they had enslaved over generations would be loyal to them before they would be loyal to their own freedom. And yet whites did believe that. And unfortunately, there were some blacks who even in this particular age, made that belief a reality, but not the majority. Nevertheless, whites believed that blacks would remain loyal, and they especially believed this about the ones whom they considered privileged, the ones who lived in the house, uh, the ones whom they gave certain privileges to, whom they uh, were skilled, uh, ones whom they hired out uh, and allowed to keep a certain amount of their earnings, so the attitude of whites was that since they had given them these minuscule privileges, then that had bound them. But as far as blacks were concerned, these privileges only meant that there were more privileges out there that they were entitled to. People oftentimes need to feel justified in their treatment of others. And with slaveholders, I think they wanted to feel that the system was okay, the system was working, and this would make them feel less fearful. If they could trust their slaves, then there was nothing to fear, and slavery itself was okay. So I think it speaks to this need to feel that oppression is something that African Americans had learned to live with. And indeed, that as far as African Americans were concerned, this was not oppression. This was simply the natural state of things. So for whites, the idea was that uh, it was okay, and they could feel good about this. And I think it had to, had a, it was a process of wanting to not fear their own slaves. Boston King and his wife, Violet King, were South Carolina African Americans who lived in the Sea Island region of South Carolina, probably 
the worst kind of bondage in terms of labor. Um, King was often hired out, and in his memoirs talks about how brutally he was treated, even though he was very hardworking, highly trained as a carpenter, and probably represents the spontaneous way in which a lot of Africans left the South to seek the British, hearing by word of mouth sometimes that the British were willing to take African Americans if they were willing to fight with them or even if they weren't, just to get away from bondage. And King himself, in order to avoid punishment, after praying to God, he was a very religious man, after praying to God, was able to get by the guards, who oftentimes stood watch because they knew that the enslaved people were trying to get to the British. So he was able to get by the guards and to get to the British lines. and. Um, he served in the British, uh, with the British forces as a result of that. That's a very fascinating history because he serves with the British, he's captured by the Americans, he escapes from the Americans and goes back to the British uh, and eventually sails with the British to Nova Scotia. Violet King represents the racial crossover between Indians and blacks. African Americans and Africans were oftentimes used against the Indians, but they were also oftentimes people who went, fled to the Indians away from the uh, whites. So it was a complex situation. And there was some intermarriage, and uh, Violet King was part Indian. And people in the region of the Sea Islands where she was helped the British, and uh, the Indians helped the British. She had relatives among the Indians who would bring food in to the British and um, keep them supplied. So there was almost like a three-way alliance uh, between blacks who were trying to serve the British and, and trying to ingratiate themselves to the British and hope that when the war was over, they would be able to leave with the British. Uh, Indians who were sort of caught in the middle and trying to decide who was going to win. Um, and uh, of course, the British, who essentially were going to try and use both blacks and Indians. The situation in the South uh, was essentially upheaval. The whites were fleeing their plantations as the British began to move into the South, sometimes trying to take their bond people with them, other times just leaving them. When they left them, Many of the African Americans took over the plantation homes, looted them, took all kinds of clothing, much of it mismatched, and um, whatever they could take with them, food, sometimes livestock, sometimes a horse if they could get it, uh, to flee to the British lines. So there was a tremendous amount of elation. There was also the question of where were they going? And it raises that question, of course, uh, that keeps coming up. What is freedom? The masters were gone in many cases, and they were free to at least leave the plantation. Now, on the way, of course, they were just as likely to meet up with a group of patriot guerrillas as the British. So there was a lot of danger. Of course, many women had children with them. There was a, the fear that uh, the children could not stand the journey. Uh, there were old people. So, you know, you're looking at a freedom struggle and large groups of people in the countryside going from place to place, sometimes not knowing where, but hoping that they were headed toward the British. So yes, there's elation at no longer having a master, but then there's some apprehension because they don't know what lies ahead. And they really don't know what to expect from the British. First of all, they didn't know if they were gonna find the British. And some of the African Americans began to leave the South in 1775, given the fact that those who got certificates of freedom didn't leave until 1783, you're talking about a long period of time in which they went through all kinds of trials. And the British camp followers were women, elderly, men, and children. And everyone had some kind of occupation.
The men, of course, were used for fighting, for foraging, for scouting. The women were cooks, they were seamstresses, they were laundresses. They carried water to the men in battle. They sometimes loaded muskets. So there was something for them to do. Um, they also formed uh, relationships with British soldiers. Black soldiers formed relationships with uh, some of the women, the loyalist women who were following the uh, British because some of the white indentured servants were also in these camps. Camp life was part of early modern warfare. And just like the Africans were following the British, there were women and children following the Americans. So a modern conception of war does not begin to understand what was happening in this war with this large train of Africans of all different descriptions and all kinds of transportation following the British. New York City is the British headquarters and eventually that is where all of the Africans who leave the plantations not only in the south but people who leave their owners in the north want to get to. That's where freedom actually lies and the road is very dubious and some people don't make it but a lot of people do and New York is the center of activity for African Americans who have sought and found freedom during the war. And so New York City has been a useful place for the British and the Africans who are there have been useful to the British. The question is what happens after the war is over? Article 7 of the Peace Treaty, the Treaty of Paris that ended the American Revolution stipulated that all property was to be returned. Well, of course, people of African descent who were in bondage are considered property. The general in charge of New York City, General Birch, did not want to return the Africans who had helped the British effort and were in New York City to their American owners in spite of what the peace treaty said. So he issued certificates of freedom to over 3,000 African Americans, men, women, and children. And this freed them, and it also permitted them to leave with the British when uh, they eventually left uh, America for the last time. This created a tremendous amount of anger on the part of the Americans. Washington protested loudly, uh, but Birch stood by those certificates, even though Many owners came from the South to try and retrieve uh, their former bonds people. And Boston King talks about the terror and the fear that uh, the Africans had in New York of being discovered by their owners. And there were situations where Africans had actually been taken by their owners and were in the process of being taken away from New York. And uh, General Birch stopped the process and sent the uh, Southerners away without their slaves. Eventually, these African Americans, anyway, were able to leave, go to Nova Scotia, and became part of that black Atlantic world, not only in Nova Scotia, some went to London, some went to Germany, some eventually went back to Africa, to Sierra Leone. So for that group, freedom became a reality, but many thousands of African Americans who aided the British lost their freedom anyway. Dunmore, the uh, architect of the, the uh, proclamation that began this whole process of African Americans serving with the British, deceived many African Americans and many of them ended up in slavery in the Caribbean. Others, when they attempted to leave with the British in places like Charleston and Savannah, were prevented and there are uh, uh, incredible letters written by Southerners of Africans after the siege of Charleston swimming out to boats and the British hacking away at their arms with cutlasses to keep them from following them. So it was a very tragic situation and of the many thousands of Africans who left the plantations, not many of them actually got their freedom. The certificate was, as far as we know, an absolute guarantee that you were going to get on a British ship, even though after Washington's protest, General Birch set up inquiry commissions to investigate the claims 
of uh, the patriots about their slaves. But as far as we know, no one who had one of those certificates was kept back. So that part of the British promise was kept. Um, but other aspects of that struggle were, were lost. So we know that they did keep that much of the promise. How you got a certificate had to do with where you were. Some people in South Carolina, in Charleston, got certificates. Some people in Savannah got certificates. And once Birch issued the certificate, then that gave the holder the right to get on a boat and go to New York City to eventually leave with the British. Some aspects of the American Revolution, especially when looking at it from the perspective of white society, make you realize it was no revolution at all. For African Americans, it was a freedom struggle. For white Americans, it was in some ways a struggle between a parent and a child that eventually were going to be reconciled. And I guess one significant example of that is the fact that at the Treaty of Paris, Henry Lawrence, planter, merchant, slave trader from Charleston, and Robert Oswald, his merchant friend and negotiator in Britain, were members of that group of people. And it indicates that in spite of this quarrel, that the interests of the two nations, as far as slavery was concerned, were identical. So it tells us something about the American Revolution as a struggle for liberty. And it gives us a perspective on what liberty and republicanism was and was not. And as far as African Americans were concerned, republicanism and liberty at that time was meaningless. When General Birch decided that he was going to issue certificates to those former enslaved people that were going to be allowed to leave with the British, he found a lot of resistance from the colonists, former colonists, and as a way of dealing with their resistance and their anger, he set up this commission and also decided that he was going to make a list of everyone whom he gave a certificate to. That became the Book of Negroes, done primarily for the sake of the Americans and to be a check on who was leaving and whether or not they were really in a position to leave, even though in actuality everyone who was in that book and given that certificate was allowed to leave. So the Book of Negroes was sort of a concession to the Americans to create this list that they could use to determine who was actually free and who was not, and as a way of, in the future, getting compensation because uh, according to the treaty, people who lost property were to be compensated. So that was really the idea of the list. What it tells us is the numbers of Africans who left and how many women there were, how long they had been free, women who took their children, men who left on their own and then ended up marrying someone and then having children, whole families leaving together. So you really get a sense of the African-American journey from as far as Savannah all the way up to New York City. So it's a fascinating piece of social history. It gives the name of the person. It gives the year which they left. Uh, their plantation or their owner. It gives the name of the owner, it gives the age, and it gives a brief description. So we know that many of the women who left were single. We know that many couples left. We know that many families left with children. Uh, so it's a very interesting and rather complete list of African Americans who uh, served with the British and were able to flee with the British. The black loyalists, as they're called, who left with the British, 
with general purchase certificates, went to Nova Scotia. Some of them ended up in London, unfortunately, as members of the London poor. Some of them ended up in some of the kingdoms of Germany. It was a very peculiar situation for the majority of them who ended up in Nova Scotia. Most of them uh, were provided with 20 acres of land. That was also a result of General Birch. The problem was that in Nova Scotia, there were also white loyalists, many of whom had been slaveholders. So the racial dynamics were very tense. And the black loyalists were treated very badly by the white loyalists in Nova Scotia. As a result of that, some left and went to England, but more importantly, they wanted to go to Sierra Leone. And a movement emerged among the blacks, Boston King was one of them, to create a group that would go to Sierra Leone. They felt that this was really the only place that they could live out their lives in freedom. Should you, my lord, while you pursue my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good, by feeling hearts alone best understood, I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancy happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his bathed beloved, such was my case. And can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway? It's Phyllis Wheatley in her verse to the Earl of Dartmouth, who was the secretary of the American Department. She wrote that poem in 1772. It speaks to a number of really important and touching issues for African Americans at that time. Phyllis Wheatley was about seven years old when she was taken from Africa. A pampered slave in the Wheatley home who very early learned Latin and Greek and very early showed signs of poetic brilliance. And as a young woman writing this, you get a very strong sense of what Africa meant to her what it meant and what she still remembered about being taken away from her parents. At the same time, she's speaking as an American and identifying with the American cause that if she, as a little girl, can feel the pangs of tyranny at being taken away from her parents, then she certainly can understand the pangs that the colonists feel in terms of being mistreated by the British. So Phyllis Wheatley is an African and an American. Uh, she has decided through her education, through her love of America, to become a spokeswoman for the American cause. And um, that does not mean that she is any less sorrowful for having been taken away from her country. But she is, at that point in her life, an American and identifying with the American cause. And it's very touching because this is an identity which she has assumed which the Americans really don't care about. She represents someone who has imbibed the American spirit of liberty, uh, and yet that spirit of liberty is not meant to apply to her. She is an exceptional African-American woman, and so she has that advantage. But on the whole, the spirit of liberty that she is espousing in this poem was not meant for African-Americans. That did not mean that they didn't experience it. Indeed, they did, and that's what she's representing. So her, her poems can be looked at in two ways, of course. You can look at them as a, uh, a comment on the hypocrisy that is evident not only in the British, but in the Americas as well, because uh, 
she is a slave in America, probably brought over on a British ship, but purchased by Bostonians. So there's a kind of hypocrisy in the British as well as in the Americans that I think this poem speaks to. Her life. One thing that Phyllis Wheatley's poems and the fact that she is a well-read, not to say simply literate African-American woman, it really speaks to, in a sense, a different experience for some African-Americans, particularly those in the Northeast, that she would be able to aspire to uh, this level of uh, development, intellectual development. So it points to the irony uh, of American life that somewhere in her early life her mistress saw a spark and decided to cultivate it. But there were many African girls with a spark that simply died. Should you, my lord, while you pursue my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung, whence flow these wishes for the common good, by feeling hearts alone best understood. I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancy happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest, what sorrows labor in my parents' breast. Steeled was that soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such was my case. And can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway? Should you, my lord, while you pursue my song, wonder from whence my love of freedom sprung? Whence flow these wishes for the common good by feeling hearts alone best understood? I, young in life, by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Afric's fancy happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor in my parents' breast? Steeled was that soul and by no misery moved that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such was my case. And can I then but pray others may never feel tyrannic sway? Phyllis Wheatley was certainly a Christian in her own belief system. As a young girl of seven living in Boston and then growing to maturity in uh, Boston in a very religious family, we can't really say that she had an African spiritual background. Her background was Christianity. But I think Phyllis Wheatley, like many African Americans, saw Christianity as a religion that spoke to their egalitarianism. And I think that that is the way she used Christianity, and that is the way she viewed Christianity. Christianity became a humanizing spirituality for African Americans, a spirituality that was part of their African heritage. And that does not mean that they were people who imbibed everything in Christianity, because there were certain contradictions in the Christian religion that many people maintained supported their enslavement. So African Americans were not Christians in the sense that they believed everything that was taught to them about Christianity or that they believed everything which they read in the Bible. And it's also important to remember that at that time in American culture, Christianity was the way in which African Americans could express their sense of liberty and their sense of freedom. I think that many people like Phyllis Wheatley and other African Americans at that time who were literate and who were writing felt that Christianity was an ideology of liberation, and I think that that's how they used it. The danger of Christianity for enslaved people is it could be a double-edged sword, that there were as many ways in which people who supported the slaveocracy could use the Bible to support Christianity 
as there was for African Americans and religious groups like the Quakers uh, who became anti-slavery to support uh, freedom. So the contradictions within the Bible created problems for African Americans who wanted to use it as an ideology of liberation. A danger would be that Christianity might promote docility, it might promote meekness, and it might encourage African Americans to be content with their lot. So African Americans had to be very selective about how they used the religious culture that they were exposed to through white society. And they had to also hang on to their own sense of spirituality as African people and to attempt to take both traditions and try and create something that was serviceable for them at that particular historical moment. It's important to keep in mind that African Americans were not Christians for quite a long time. That Christianity was a religion that the whites did not want them exposed to uh, because of certain egalitarian principles in the New Testament, because of the militant Jewish nationalism of the Old Testament. So there was a concerted effort to keep Christianity away from them. Now this was an effort that certain religious groups fought and as some African Americans became Christians, they also resisted the effort to keep it away from them. But for the most part, most African Americans were not exposed to the tenets of Christianity as we in the modern times think of them. But African Americans had a spiritual purview and it was a spirituality based on their own African backgrounds merging with certain tenets of Christianity. It's also important to keep in mind that Africans came from cultures that had some principles akin to Christianity. They believed in a supreme God. They believed in an afterlife. They believed in a concept of the soul. They believed in something different in terms of what happens to the soul and the body after a person dies. But they had very important tenets that they brought with them that fit into Christianity. Also, there were some Africans from the Congo and Angolan region that were familiar with certain aspects of Christianity through the Portuguese. So Christianity was not something that was totally new to them. And even so, with the situation of slaveholders not wanting them to know that much about Christianity, with their own community network that was relatively in cultural isolation, Christianity was something that for many years was the, kind of the periphery of their culture in which they would take parts of it and use it and uh, take other parts and, and ignore it. So it was really a creation of African beliefs and those parts of uh, this Western religion that they found useful for them. A people in bondage would be very taken by the story of Moses leading the children out of Egypt. That was a very important theme for African Americans. And that was the kind of militancy in the story of the Jews that slaveholders didn't want the Africans to imbibe. And of course, later on, Africans used those very themes for resistance. Africans also believed that baptism meant freedom. And planters and other slaveholders were very weary of missionaries going amongst the Africans and baptizing them because for Africans that represented a rite of passage, a transition. Something had to change. If I'm baptized, I'm a new person, as was the case in African culture, because water is very important in African culture, and it represents a transformation. So for Africans, being baptized had to mean that something about them was different. 
And also the Europeans, one of the justifications for enslaving Africans was that they were heathen. Okay, I'm baptized, I am no longer heathen, then I should be free. So this was something that the slaveholders had to deal with because for Africans, it represented a transition. And even though laws were passed, specifically stating that baptism does not confer freedom, Africans didn't believe it. The period of the American Revolution represents for African Americans the first concerted freedom struggle that permeates the entire colonial population of African Americans. It represents the first period when African Americans as a, an entire group from Georgia all the way up to the Northeast are on the move and seeking freedom and they have always been seeking freedom since they came to the colonies. But it's always been resistance here, rebellion there, robberies, poisonings, uh, fires, sporadic. But the ideology of revolution, the ideology of republicanism that permeates white society is picked up on in a very meaningful way by African Americans. and they move, and the entire countryside, with all of the, the turmoil and the destruction that takes place because of the war, in the middle of all that is this constant movement, um, like a long black line from Savannah all the way up to New York. So that I think for African Americans, things will never be the same after the American Revolution in terms of their concepts about the ideology of freedom. The Constitution itself is not a Republican document. What makes the Constitution Republican and at least quasi-egalitarian is the Bill of Rights. Without that, the Constitution is a document designed to serve property holders. So we have to look at the Constitution as one document that supports property and interests mainly. And then we have to look at the Bill of Rights, which is really for the people, that is white people, essentially white males. Uh, but the fact that it's there and the fact that it has these guaranteed rights for citizens at least opens up the argument for African Americans and of course for women in terms of what is a citizen? Because these rights are there for citizens, then people who are defined outside of that, the other, can aspire to citizenship so that they can retrieve some of these rights. Without the Bill of Rights, then there would be nothing to go on. The Bill of Rights opens up the Constitution and makes it a document of republicanism and quasi-egalitarianism. It is what makes America a democracy for whites, for white males, essentially. Um, and more than African Americans, for white females. But certainly not for everyone. But the fact that the Bill of Rights is there provides an avenue for Americans living in the United States and yet not considered Americans to at some point in their history say, hey, wait a minute, that includes me too. And that's what African Americans do. That's how they use the Bill of Rights. That's how they use republicanism. One of the biggest issues in the Constitution and the constitutional debate, an issue that almost just completed, completely disintegrated the convention, was over the issue of enslavement and how you regard enslavement and, of course, how you regard the enslaved. The Southern people, uh, the Southern men at the Constitutional Convention, wanted slavery to be part of the document. Even though the word slave is not mentioned in the Constitution, it's implied in many ways. Uh, and so, in very important ways, the South got what they wanted. And the North's answer to that was that it's the only way we can get a Constitution. because. Enslaved people were property, 
and the Southern attitude was that they had a right to keep their property. Many in the North were making noise about ending slavery. Indeed, Massachusetts had ended slavery by the time of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, Pennsylvania had a gradual manumission law. New York and New Jersey were dilly-dallying and you know, uh, trying to fight the tide, but it was in the air. And the Southerners were afraid of that because once the North emancipated their bond people, then as far as the Southerners were concerned, they were going to look to them to do the same thing because there's also an emerging anti-slavery movement among whites who have freed their slaves, especially the Quakers. So it's a contradiction and it's a conflict for the North. They want a strong federal government to protect their property. Uh, the South want that as well, but for the Southerners, the most important form of property they have is human property. So the Founding Fathers have to make adjustments, uh, and the adjustments which they make bind the people of African descent to bondage until the Civil War. Acts in places like Massachusetts by people like Elizabeth Freeman and other African Americans who petitioned the Massachusetts General Court, these kinds of maneuvers are what eventually led to the Massachusetts General Court by virtue of the Constitution of, of Massachusetts saying that all men are created equal, uh, which implied and, and was interpreted by the court as saying that there was to be no slavery, uh, all men being all women. But if we can imagine this woman, um, the slave woman, reading a constitution and saying, well, if everybody is created equal, then that includes me too, and challenging the state government on this issue, uh, it was acts like that that forced the Massachusetts legislature to look long and hard at the whole contagion of liberty. And there were other African Americans who did similar uh, kinds of acts. Paul Cuffey and his brother refused to pay their taxes. They were landowners, they were fairly wealthy African Americans, uh, and yet they had no rights. They were jailed for this, but they were eventually let out of jail, and uh, these kinds of acts, these kinds of challenges to the state governments eventually led to massive emancipation for uh, people in various states in the North. So in that sense, even those who didn't serve in the Army, either in the British or in the American Army, still worked to bring about their own freedom. Colonel Ty was probably one of the most colorful individuals during the period of the American Revolution. Colonel Ty was actually an enslaved man, about 20 or 21, named Titus, who was owned by a Quaker, I think by the name of Corlius. And Ty was a part of a movement among Africans in New Jersey. He was a, an enslaved man in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Part of a movement during the war on the part of slaves to leave the plantations. It was an interesting situation because his owner was a Quaker and the Quaker church had recently come out against slavery, first excommunicating Quakers who engaged in the slave trade and then excommunicating Quakers who refused to put their bond people on the road to manumission, which Ty's owner refused to do. When the American Revolution emerged, Ty emerged as a fearless leader. He was only about 21, and uh, he commanded both black and white loyalists, and literally wreaked havoc in New Jersey and also in New York. He captured patri patriots, he executed patriots, he visited the region of Monmouth where he was from and burned and looted the slaveholders, freed slaves, uh, had probably uh, 
800 men under his command at one point, both black and white, and he would capture people if he didn't want to execute them, send them to what was called the Sugar House in New York City, and, uh, and then go on his guerrilla raids. He was probably more feared in that region than any other British loyalist, black or white. Uh, and um, the kind of guerrilla warfare that he engaged in kept the country in turmoil, even to the point where Governor Livingston of New Jersey could not send troops to aid Washington because he was afraid that this would leave an opening for Ty, uh, and uh, he had to keep his own men with him. So he was very important in terms of uh, the morale of African Americans, because many of them joined him. Others who didn't join him certainly got a big charge out of the fact that here was this black man who was leading these raids against the patriots, freeing slaves, and it gave them a sense of their own capacity and they began to flee the farms and to move into the British, those who didn't join uh, Thai, and also to, to fight in little guerrilla skirmishes themselves. So he was really largely responsible for the war effort in a non-orderly way, but in a sort of a guerrilla way in the New Jersey countryside. A very important uh, individual who remained on the scene uh, beginning in 1778, all the way up through 1780. Maroon communities were part of Southern resistance among African Americans. Almost from the time Africans came to the colony, especially the frontier colonies of Carolina and Georgia, when they fled, many of them would set up communities. And many of the people in the enslaved communities knew about these maroon communities, sometimes fortified them with food, told them when the whites were on their trail so they could move more and more into the interior. Some of them formed alliances with Indians. This was the case from the Carolinas all the way down to Florida. And it was the case throughout the colonial era. When the American Revolution began, these communities became larger and they became stronger. And it's important in the context of the American Revolution because we tend to think only in terms of Africans going to the British or fighting with the Americans or joining the Indians. But they also formed their own little villages, their little maroon societies in unsettled areas of Georgia, on various remote islands in South Carolina, and in Florida. And sometimes they would make attacks on plantations and then uh, disappear. Sometimes they would even go into these uh, plantations and take people back with them, sometimes even by force. Uh, and in this way, they fortified their communities. But during the Revolution, there was an upsurge of these communities. And they remained there. They were very hard to get rid of. But eventually, by around 1800, uh, they had all been pretty much uh, taken care of. As you move into Florida, uh, and especially in parts of Spanish Florida, you also find these maroon communities, some of whom had been involved in maronage during the revolution and then rather than be captured, had moved into Florida. Of course, these were not flushed out until uh, the time of Andrew Jackson. But Moronage was very much a part of the American revolutionary experience, and it probably represents more than anything else the autonomy within some of the African American communities. And probably the Maroons were mainly those people who were closest to Africa, who were comfortable neither with the British nor with the Americans nor with the Indians, but wanted to live among themselves in their own communities, as close to an African culture as they could get. A Maroon community was a community of Africans who moved away from the plantations, usually in a group, and set up little communities in remote areas where they were not likely to be discovered. They grew crops, they had livestock, they built homes, 
they raised families, and they had guards around their fortifications. So they were essentially little African villages in the frontier regions. During the time of the American Revolution, there were more and more of these as African Americans decided they did not want to join either one of the war efforts. So the question is, who would become a Maroon? Probably the people who became Maroons were those closest to Africa, those who were least comfortable with British culture or American culture or Indian culture, those who had been born in Africa, had lived in relatively isolated situations like you find in the low country of Carolina and Georgia. And once the war became so intense that planters began to flee, and of course some enslaved people fled to the British, some went to the Indians, these individuals formed their own communities on various islands, in the coastal region, in uh, the hinterlands, and always being on the watch for discovery by whites. And they lived out this kind of a life for uh, quite a long time. Freedom means different things to different people, and it meant different things to different African Americans. For a Phyllis Wheatley, freedom meant actual freedom, liberty, which she was able to obtain. But it also, for her, would mean the ability to express herself in a literary fashion, because she was a poetess. So for her, freedom meant physical freedom and cultural freedom of expression. For Africans in Maroon communities, they wanted freedom away from white culture. That to them was freedom. Um, and that's a different kind of freedom. It's not the republicanism of some of the individuals who fought with the British, some of the individuals who fought with the American patriots. It's a kind of freedom that harks back to their own heritage. And it really means that they don't want anything to do with American culture. So that is their concept of freedom. Um, and then, of course, other people find that the freedom one is able to obtain in Indian cultures, to intermarry with the Indians, uh, to still live a relatively frontier kind of life, but again, away from white culture, was another kind of freedom. Philadelphia in the 1790s becomes a center for blacks in the North. It has a large black population, and the people, the whites in Philadelphia, many of whom are Quakers, are more receptive to African Americans, at least in this period. The Quaker religion has a lot to do with that. The idea that slavery was wrong, which was a new idea for the Quakers, uh, a new idea in terms of them beginning to accept it and beginning to insist that members of the Quaker meeting act on that. Uh, so Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love, was for African Americans in the 1790s kind of a mecca, coming out of bondage, coming out of the American Revolution, looking for a place to be free. African Americans who had been in bondage came to Philadelphia, uh, and this was sort of the beginning of the institutional development of freedom in uh, the North. The message of liberty and republicanism, so important in the American Revolution, was certainly something that African Americans were aware of and were imbibing and were trying to act out in places where they could. And there were many places in the North where they could not. So aside from a lot of them wanting to leave the South, the upper South states of Maryland and uh, Virginia and Delaware. They also wanted to go where this ideology of liberty and equality might really mean something. So Philadelphia was a good place to try that out. Well, of course, some of them were there in very important ways. Um, and 
that sort of planted the seed. The fact that the Quakers, especially among the Philadelphians, believed in education uh, for the people whom they held in bondage and allowed them a certain amount of flexibility meant that you had an emerging middle class. The African Americans in other places would want to come to Philadelphia. They would come from Delaware, Maryland, uh, the Northeast, certainly places like New York where slavery uh, was still very much a fact of life, and New Jersey. So all of the Northeastern states, the mid-Atlantic states like New York and New Jersey, the southern states, the upper southern states like Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, some people from the Northeast were beginning to converge in Philadelphia because they had a sense that this was a place that equality and republicanism might really mean something. One of the reasons African Americans would want to go to Philadelphia was because of their whole manumission movement. Even though Philadelphia had a manumission process that was gradual, it was early. It was really the, the earliest uh, of the northern states to engage in uh, manumission. So that's the first clue for African Americans that this is a place that they want to be in, where freedom for people of African descent is taken seriously. So, um, and even before Philadelphia or Pennsylvania had a manumission law, Quakers in Philadelphia were freeing their slaves. And, uh, and not just freeing them, but freeing them, finding apprenticeships for them, trying to find an educational situation for them. So it was a way in which African Americans could hopefully find freedom. Most of the African Americans work in domestic uh, capacity and domestic not in the sense that we tend to think of domestic work such as cleaning houses, but at that time domestic work meant all kinds of things. You could be a groomer uh, as well as someone who cleaned homes. Um, you could uh, work outside doing landscape. Uh, it really represented work around a dwelling. So a lot of African Americans did that. Philadelphia was one of the few cities where African Americans could actually become carters, uh, which was a very important occupation uh, if you were fortunate enough to have a horse. And it was steady work. So uh, in New York, for instance, African Americans could not become carters. Uh, it was a, a highly regimented uh, occupation. So that was another occupation. Wagoners um, working on the wharves, artisans, because some of the whites in Philadelphia had trained their former slaves for, uh, in the skilled occupations. So labor was needed, and African Americans could find employment in Philadelphia. Richard Allen, for probably the majority of African Americans coming into Philadelphia, was a very important figure, himself having been a slave and understanding that experience made them very close to him. His religious orientation also, uh, his evangelism, his Methodism uh, was very important because Methodism became a very significant religious orientation in Philadelphia. So Allen was one of them. Uh, he uh, was prosperous, but at the same time, certainly not of the upper class. And there were African Americans who uh, were upper class, but he was uh, a former slave. He was someone who was uh, essentially unskilled, but able to do a lot and uh, he was a carter, he hired people, hired African Americans to work for him. So he was a major figure, a leader, good speaker. Um, so he was someone whom the, to whom they could uh, look. Richard Allen had been a slave in Delaware. Moving to Philadelphia as a young man, he probably decided that he wanted to be in a place where there was no slavery or at least it was on the road to extinction, 
and probably was just part of a large migration of people who were moving toward places where freedom seemed to be the wave of the future. Um, Delaware was essentially a slave state. So the move north was part of a process for African Americans, and it's really, it really is a historical process of moving from the place where you were enslaved to a different situation that does not remind you of that bondage. So Allen was part of that movement, and there was employment in Philadelphia. So as African Americans were moving, and they were moving toward a freedom site, then he was undoubtedly caught up in that. For one thing, they are not in a system where freedom is an anomaly. The problem with being a free person in the South is that it's not the natural order. The natural order is slavery. So there's a thin line between slavery and freedom in the South. And free blacks who don't have strong family ties in the South and are not proscribed from leaving the South because of various black codes in other, other states, would naturally want to leave uh, because the Southerners don't make much of a distinction between slavery and freedom, and also because in some cases they're often looking for ways to re-enslave you. Jarena Lee was born free, but like many African American children, she was indentured. This was sort of a common practice because, for one thing, the family needed money. For another, it was important for children to learn some kind of occupation. Um, so for her, it meant leaving her family and probably being the only person in the household who was working. Either that or she might have been working with someone much older who was training her. But in these kinds of situations, there was often little form of community. So it's sort of an isolating life. Children were often allowed to visit their parents on occasion, or the parents were permitted to visit them. But the situation was one in which you really had no immediate bonding situation. So uh, for Jarena, it was probably a learning experience, probably part of the motivation she later had uh, and the sense of independence that she later had, that she was taken away from her parents so early and kind of in a sheltered situation, but at the same time pretty much on her own. The despair in the narrative is part of the narrative tradition. It's part of what individuals, men and women, in the African American experience go through in their religious conversion. Jarena Lee, George White, uh, all of these individuals who basically write spiritual narratives about their spiritual journey have a period it could last for a month, it could last for years, in which they are in utter despair, very unsatisfied with themselves as individuals, and wavering in terms of their identity. The question that they ask is, who am I? And what is my reason for being? And if they have no answer, and if they're really extremely spiritually motivated, the way people like Jarena Lee is, they can't find an answer, then they come up with their own answer, and that is, I must be nobody. And I think that's what created her despair, is that she could not reconcile with herself who she was, what her identity was. And so she, she goes through this period where she's just in despair. She explains it as her lack of spiritual direction, uh, which is very important to African Americans. and. Uh, probably more important for her because she is isolated. I mean, she, she sort of reaches maturity in an isolated situation without the bonding of, without parental bonding 
and probably without uh, communal bonding. So it, in, a, in a way, it's just her. And so she has to come to terms with who she is, who she is spiritually is probably more important to her than anything else. So I think that's probably what causes her despair in this, this talk of, of suicide. Well, she would be working in a home. She would be probably trained by someone, either uh, an older servant or the mistress of the house. That's the kind of work, housework is the kind of work that you do alone um, or with white uh, servants. So she is doing labor in the kitchen, doing labor in the parlor, uh, probably serving food, probably involved in waiting on people in social situations, but not getting anything out of these kinds of situations herself. So her work is not gratification. And it's, it's interesting because people spend so much time with labor. And some African Americans are in situations where they're working communally, collectively, whether it's men working on the wharves or women working in, a, a, say, a mansion where there are four or five servants. Um, work is what creates a kind of collectivity. And I think that uh, Zerina, uh, Jarena didn't have that. Well, we can imagine her as probably very quiet, um, probably introspective, and it's kind of hard to imagine what kind of a person Zarina Lee was. She went through a transformation, a spiritual transformation in her early 20s. What was she like before that? She could have been someone who was very quiet, very introspective, not very sure of herself, not really knowing how to deal with people on a social situation since she was in this apprenticeship, and not really having much connectedness. And her transformation, her spiritual transformation, could have very easily opened her up socially, could have given her the sense of confidence that she may not have had before. On the other hand, she might have been a person who, before her conversion, was social, was outgoing, and the conversion and the preaching, which she becomes so heavily engaged in, and the anti-slavery attitudes were already there. And they became spiritually motivated once she was converted. So in a way, of course, she could have either personality. She could have been a woman who was very quiet and subdued um, and changed, metamorphosed into the woman she became after her spiritual awakening. Or she could have been like other spiritual women and other preaching women like Sojourner Truth who were vibrant and outgoing before and once they made the spiritual transformation, transposed that vibrancy into their religiosity. Conversion for Zarina was probably a freedom, a different kind of freedom from someone who was in bondage, uh, a spiritual freedom that helped her define her personhood. Part of her despair before her conversion was probably because she didn't know who she was. And the conversion, as she put it, reclothed her. And uh, not that she was unclothed in the first place, but she felt that way. She felt insufficient. And so the process of conversion was a change, a spiritual change that essentially transposed itself into a material change so that she was changed from the heart but at the same time, she could feel that she was even materially changed. New clothes, could have been even uh, a new kind of hair. Everything about her was new. And it's very reminiscent of conversion experiences with which African Americans go through at that time in terms of something happening that is totally different and sets them apart. And 
it's not the physical freedom, it's the spiritual freedom. So she's, she has physical freedom, she does not have this spiritual, organic wholeness. And, and that's what she gets when she has this incredible awakening. Well, her spiritual conversion changes her entire life. Had she not had this with such intensity and energy, then we would never know that there was a Jarena Lee. But it gives her an assertion uh, to the point where she feels perfectly confident standing up in church in the middle of a sermon and interrupting the minister. It's hard to believe that that kind of assertiveness came after her conversion. One almost wants to think that she must have been a pretty spunky young woman before the conversion. But on the other hand, perhaps there was that much of a transformation for her. There was that much of a sense of what spirituality meant. Uh, and it made her fearless. So she develops, as a result of her conversion, probably this fearlessness that makes her willing to confront the church hierarchy, makes her willing to approach Richard Allen and ask for permission to preach. This may seem like a small thing, but it really isn't, because women following the St. Paulian doctrine are not supposed to speak in public. They can pray in the private homes and exhort in the private homes, but they're not supposed to speak in public. So for Zarina to challenge this uh, is incredibly bold for that period of time, I and mean, when you're talking the early national period. So women are very reticent and, uh, and they stay in their place. This is especially true of African-American women. So her spirituality liberates her makes her a liberated woman, essentially. Uh, and, uh, and she is willing to confront Alan. And essentially, at that point, gets nowhere. But later on, uh, because of her tenacity and probably because as her reputation spreads, she is successful as a preacher. Zarina went among the African-American slaves to preach. Probably the first woman preacher they had ever heard. Uh, preaching about Christianity, not the first African spiritual woman, because the African tradition was one in which women were very important spiritually. So slaves certainly were familiar with female spirituality, but to have a woman come among them and actually stand up and preach Christianity very boldly must have had a tremendous effect on them. One can't help but wonder you know, what they thought, whether their American cultural purview where women don't speak in public, or their African cultural purview where women did have that kind of a role, really took hold. But the fact that she was there, the fact that she was bringing Christianity to them, must have had a tremendous effect on them. African Americans were always very anxious to hear one of their own. Um, anyone who was willing to go among them, if they were allowed to, and oftentimes they were not, if they were allowed to hear one of their own, and if they had a choice between hearing a white speaker and one of their own, then the choice was going to be with the black speaker. And missionaries and ministers commented on this constantly. So. It must have meant a great deal for them. Now, was it the message? Was it the messenger? Was it the novelty of it? Whatever it was, there was something very moving about Jarena that made them want to go and hear her. What's even more interesting is that she was allowed to do it. Um, that tells us something about her as well. This is a period when Many people, many whites, have not accepted Christianity as something that African-American enslaved people should hear. It's also a period when they feel that Christianity may be taught in such a way as to encourage liberation. So the fact that she's even able to go among them uh, is, is very unusual.
it's unusual for a woman. Uh, I mean, it's unusual for a man. So for a woman, it's quite extraordinary. Thomas Jefferson is very important to African American history. Not all of it is positive. Certainly Jefferson gave us the Declaration of Independence, even though at the time the document was written, it did not apply to people of African descent, but it came to apply to them. So he's important in that sense. He's also important because he was one of the major architects of American republicanism. And even though that concept was not meant to apply to people of African descent, they understood that it did, and they acted on that. But I think we also owe Jefferson modern racism because Jefferson is really one of the first people and certainly the most important person to discuss in writing black inferiority. He's the first person to discuss in writing the idea that blacks and whites cannot live together uh, as equals. And he is one of the first people to put in writing attitudes about black sexuality, negative attitudes about black sexuality. And of course, Jefferson used his executive powers to obtain Louisiana. And that entrenched bondage in American society until 1861. So um, Jefferson's heritage, as far as African American history is concerned, is um, both positive and, and negative. Monticello, to me, represents black labor black skill, because clearly the way Monticello was set up, a self-sufficient estate with blacksmith shop, uh, carpentry, all of the things one needed to create the kind of estate that Monticello became, all of that was produced by slave labor. Jefferson's carpentry shop was run by James Hemings, who had as his apprentices various people in the Hemings family. They produced much of the furniture, some of the very creative furniture in uh, Monticello, such as the revolving bookcase, um, beautiful chairs, the dumbwaiter uh, that uh, was very ingenious for the time of bringing food up from the kitchen. So when I look at Monticello, uh, I think of Mulberry Row and the slave quarters, and the buildings which are no longer standing that represented all of the artisan work that went on in uh, that society and that was done by black labor. Jefferson was probably interested in the cotton gin as an inventor, um, wondered if it was really gonna work. Uh, he would certainly be interested in it as a planter, obviously, because so much labor went into cotton and extracting the seeds the old way. So certainly he would have to be interested in it as a planter. He would also have to be interested in it as an individual who looked toward the future of the nation. He was an agrarian and he saw the future of the nation in agrarian terms. Unfortunately, agrarian terms meant slave labor. So the cotton gin couldn't help but mean for Jefferson the expansion of cotton. Progress has different meanings for different people. And for people of African descent, the cotton gin was not progress. It was a further entrenchment of enslavement. And for African Americans, the Industrial Revolution, those technological advances in the textile industry did not mean progress. It meant slavery. So we have to understand that during this period, what was progress for white people was enslavement and further degradation for African Americans. So the cotton gin was important, probably the most important invention in American history up to the Civil War. But it carried a great price. It carried a price for black people, and it also carried a price for white people. Because while the country advanced economically because of this technology, 
it created a system that they were going to have to deal with later on. For African Americans, the invention of the cotton gin can be measured in terms of the separation of families because the gin developed the territory which Jefferson was able to obtain, the Louisiana Territory. It expanded cotton, expanded the land of the United States, and cotton was able to be produced on a massive scale. African Americans were the individuals who were, who were moved into this uh, frontier region, and they usually took men and left the women and children behind. So one aspect of the cotton gin was that African American families were separated as the cotton kingdom spread and as, say, the sons of younger planters took men out into places like Alabama and set up uh, new cotton estates. So that was one major aspect of it. The other aspect of it that represented just the antithesis of progress for African Americans was that it created an expansive domestic slave system. So on the one hand, you have men who are taken away from their families and uh, forced to go to the territories and work, and oftentimes forced to marry new women uh, and create new families. On the other hand, you have the situation of, say, a place like Virginia, which no longer has a monocrop but has a gigantic slave population. And many of the individuals who settle in the Louisiana Territory buy their enslaved people from Virginia. And these individuals are taken into this new frontier region. The cotton gin represented for African Americans the antithesis of progress because it increased the domestic slave trade. It created a massive domestic slave trade. Virginia, for example, which was a state that no longer had a one-crop economy, tobacco, but had a massive slave population, more slaves in Virginia than any other state, and yet they didn't have the economy to support this population. So they became the place that supplied the territories with slaves. And this was a, a situation of despair for African Americans because individuals were sold and oftentimes they did sell people as individuals, although sometimes they would say that they preferred to sell them in families, but that was not uh, necessary. So individuals would be separated and the uh, families would go in various different ways. The Atlantic slave is officially banned in the United States in 1808. So legally, no slaves from Africa can come into the United States. Now the reality of that is far different. They do come in. Uh, they come in in South Carolina, they come in in Florida, they come in in all kinds of places. They come in through the Spanish areas. But legally, they're not supposed to be there. So the system has to rely on the individuals who are in the United States. Officially, the Atlantic slave trade ends in 1808. From 1801 to 1808, in anticipation of the closing of the Atlantic trade, 39,000 Africans are brought into the United States, most of them through South Carolina and, of course, legally. After 1808, because the cotton gin has revolutionized cotton production the illegal slave trade is still very much a factor. And even though the domestic slave trade is creating a situation where Africans are being pushed into the frontier, they're not enough. And Americans wink at the trade. And um, Africans continue to come in. So even though the trade is abolished, there's still this constant not a flow, but certainly a trickle of Africans. And this continues all the way up to the Civil War. Smuggling was supposedly illegal, but it was a situation in which people really didn't 
receive any penalty for this. And the Africans, once they were in the country, were simply enslaved. So the law in many ways was not enforceable. On the other hand, some individuals, some states especially, had already stopped importing. So there wasn't a problem. But for those states that had continued to import, and then also as the trade, uh, as, not the trade, as the cotton gin made expansion possible, then individuals who had not engaged in it began the process. There's a very large artisan population in Richmond, Virginia, where Gabriel's conspiracy uh, is aimed. And the Africans, these African-American artisans who are skilled, who have some modicum of autonomy, and who are familiar with the rhetoric of republicanism, who are familiar with the ideology of revolution, the American Revolution, and are familiar with events that took place in Haiti, began to agitate for their own freedom. And they converge around the leadership of Gabriel, himself an artisan, and uh, take in all of the rhetoric of the age, republicanism, the enlightenment, the idea of an artisan kind of equality, evangelism. These ideas that are part of American culture become part of the purview of these artisans. One of the reasons the rebellion was able to be planned so carefully and to involve so many people over such a wide geographical range was the fact that the conspirators at the leadership level were artisans. So they had a certain amount of freedom. Some of them were hired out, so it was not unusual to see them coming and going. Uh, some of them had occupations that might take them outside of Richmond. So it was that element of flexibility within the system itself that gave them the avenues they needed to recruit. I think African Americans in the United States knew about Haiti. I think they knew about the rebellion, about the black leadership. Certainly with the French immigrants coming into the port cities of the United States, sometimes bringing their Africans with them, and the interaction of black on black, there was no way they couldn't know about what was happening. We can never really know what Gabriel's goals were, whether they were, as some people think, an effort to form a coalition between white and black artisans and to make republicanism a reality uh, in a way that it wasn't uh, at that point in history, whether he was going to try and get to Haiti uh, with his recruits, but neither one of those possibilities seem as real to me as Gabriel really not knowing what he wanted to do as a goal, what he wanted as a goal, except that he did want to foment a rebellion and to gain liberty for black people. I think that he saw a rebellion in Richmond along the lines of what happened in Haiti, that they could get enough of a movement going so that they could actually bargain for their liberty. And I think that his concerns were more for African Americans in bondage than for forming a coalition with white artisans. Recruitment took place for the rebellion in grog shops that were biracial with um, blacks and whites getting together and drinking. Sometimes there were women of both races there. Took place on farms, took place in the shops where blacks worked, uh, sometimes independently. Took, places, took place in, in, in situations where Africans uh, lived. Uh, people who were not part of the, uh, the artisan group. 
and probably took place at some of the religious gatherings that uh, Gabriel's followers frequented. So, you know, there were a number of avenues for artisans to pursue the idea of rebellion. Gabriel's rebellion has been seen as mainly an artisan rebellion. Um, certainly artisans who, again, had a kind of quasi-freedom would want more. They would want total freedom. So that would motivate an individual, being half free, uh, not being able to control your wages, being hired out, being highly skilled, and having to give your wages to someone else, knowing how much you were worth, and, and not being able to keep any of your labor. Other people might want to rebel because they were so oppressed that they saw nothing else, that if this was living, then there had to be a better way, and that better way was worth dying for. Others might join because they were familiar with the tenets of Christianity and the egalitarian elements in that Christianity. And then, of course, there were reportedly some whites who were involved in the conspiracy, and these individuals as far as we know, were very involved in the ideals of French republicanism that they talked about among the enslaved people. So certainly the ideology of republicanism would be something that uh, Africans and African Americans could identify with. People would decline out of fear because there was a history of uprisings not really being successful and it was a great chance to take, and uh, the price of freedom is often death. So people would be afraid to do that. People would also not want to, well, some African Americans were, some African Americans were very close to their masters and mistresses. And of course we know that because many of the rebellions that occurred were divulged by blacks themselves. So some blacks were close enough to white society in their own minds that they not only would not want to rebel, but they would tell about a rising. African Americans would be involved in Gabriel's rebellion for a number of reasons. The artisans of which Gabriel was one were individuals who were highly skilled and knew their value and yet received none of the proceeds of their labor. Other artisans were hired out and actually had to bring the money to their owner. And so they could actually hold this money that they were worth in their hands and not be able to keep any of it and be able to come and go as they chose back and forth from the person whom they worked for back to their masters. So on the one hand, you're taking away everything that a person earns. On the other hand, you're allowing him to go freely back and forth. So the dualism was something that was very difficult for artisans to live with. Other people might join the rebellion because of the evangel evangelistic aspects of Christianity, the spiritual egalitarianism uh, that they believed in, and Gabriel, of course, uh, would go to these uh, religious gatherings and talk to them. So within Christianity, there was an egalitarian spirit as well. Also, there was the Republican ideology, which again, the artisans were aware of. This was something that had been talked about since before the revolution and was talked about even more after the revolution, especially in places like Virginia. So they were aware of this ideology and then, of course, there were individuals from the North who frequented the grog shops, biracial grog shops, where some of the artisans uh, went to drink and to talk. And they spoke often of French republicanism and um, the fact that Africans ought to be free. And finally, of course, you have to take into consideration the Haitian Rebellion and the message that that sent
to people in the United States who wanted their freedom as well. That if the Haitians could rise, why couldn't they? Blacks would say that Gabriel's rebellion didn't happen because of a stroke of bad luck. Whites would say that it was God smiling on them. Rains came, washed out the bridges into Richmond, and the individuals who had gathered to create this rebellion could not get into the city. So whether it was divine interference or what, Gabriel's rebellion didn't happen. We can imagine what it was like on that day in August in 1800 with scores of African Americans gathering on a Sunday to create this rebellion with picks and axe and knives and clubs because they hadn't yet gotten to the arsenal, which was in Virginia, waiting for the time for this to come. And then the rains coming, and the rains never ceasing. And what it must have been like for them, prepared to strike and yet unable to strike. And what it must have been like as the bridge washed away and their hopes were dampened and then finally their hopes were gone that this rebellion was going to actually take place and what must have happened at that point because the white society had been alerted that something was going to happen and in a way was prepared but in a way didn't really believe it. Um, so here they were ready to strike and they couldn't get to the arsenal, they couldn't get into Richmond. This was a terrible moment for Gabriel. He'd invested so much, he had recruited so much, other people had invested so much, and he, as the leader, undoubtedly felt responsible, even though clearly no one could blame him for the disaster that happened as a result of the, the rain. He must have felt that this was the worst moment of his life. With all these people depending on him for leadership and liberation and to have nowhere to turn. So it was a situation in which the rebellion seemed to be dead. Interestingly enough, the rebellion was larger than Gabriel and others attempted to continue it. We think that the VC conspiracy emerged as a result of the white attitude toward the formation of a black African Methodist church. That was probably the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Clearly there were other incidents in black life in Charleston and the surrounding area that would make African Americans want to strike for their freedom. A lot of them had, a lot of those reasons had to do with the AME church and with the Methodist church, had to do with the fact that in spite of African Americans being the great majority of the Methodist church in Charleston, they had no control over their own money and uh, they had no control over burials. They essentially were people who were being used by the Methodist Church. And there were thousands of them in the church. So they formed their own church so that they could be independent religiously, worship the way they want to. And because the institution of religion was so important to the African Americans, it was very much necessary in their minds for their community formation to have control over their churches. Denmark Vesey's ideology, theology, whatever you want to call it, was probably very complex. He would quote Greek passages. He would quote the Bible. He certainly knew about the Haitian Revolution and Toussaint. He was a class leader in the AME church. He was probably African born. He felt that it was absolutely essential that they have an African diviner in the leadership as well as 
black Methodists. So it was a very complex ideology. It was as though V.C. was creating his own black republicanism, not based on white ideology, but a combination of cultures that African Americans had been exposed to. We don't know what V.C.'s ultimate goal was once his group achieved freedom, if they had achieved it. Some people say they wanted to sail to Haiti, um, but we don't know that. We do know that they were very serious about freedom, and they used the African Methodist Church to espouse an ideology of freedom. So V.C. believed very strongly in the Old Testament, and he believed very strongly in the book of Exodus, as well as other books. He that stealeth a man shall be put to death. And the conspirators had decided that they were going to kill all the ministers except for a few. And those they were going to take and show them various passages in the Bible and say, why didn't you teach us this? Why didn't you teach us this? To show the hypocrisy of the Methodist church as it was practiced in South Carolina. Turner, Nat Turner, very much like V.C., but probably even more so because V.C. used a number of ideologies, including African spiritualism, Turner relied almost completely on the Bible, especially the Old Testament for his wrath. Um, in the Old Testament, God is a God of wrath. In the Old Testament, God's wrath on the Egyptians knows no bounds for what they have done to his people. In Turner's mind, the chosen people of God are African Americans, and the Egyptians are whites. So he feels perfectly justified in carrying out his vengeance in the same way God carries out his wrath against the Egyptians. There is a sense of a providential journey in the African American experience, say for instance from the beginning of the cotton gin as a method of, of expanding slavery and creating havoc in black life through the separation of families, through this incessant labor, uh, which seems to be able to go on in perpetuity. For African Americans, it represents a period when their idea of providence is that this is not pleasing in the sight of God. And based on the Old Testament, they can see themselves as God's chosen people. And they act this out in very significant ways from Gabriel's aspect, the, the religious aspect of Gabriel's rebellion, especially the ideology of the new, oops, especially the ideology of the Old Testament and Denmark V.C., and of course the ideology of the Old Testament that is embedded in Nat Turner's rebellion. So that aspect of the American experience for people of African descent is one that bespeaks of the wrath of God being visited on whites. It does not materialize at that point but it does not stop African Americans from believing that at some point God is going to interfere in their behalf. Christianity for African Americans at this time means the antithesis of oppression. And I think they understand Christianity in those terms because we always have to keep in mind that in many places of the South, Christianity in a concerted, orderly fashion is kept away from people of African descent. So they get Christianity in snippets and in imagery. And the imagery that speaks to them most boldly and most plainly is the image of the children of Israel being led out of bondage. They can identify with that immediately. And for many of the African Americans at this time, this is Christianity. Nat Turner is the personification of this. Nat Turner can read and write. Most African Americans cannot. But he represents the people of African descent as they viewed Christianity, as an ideology of liberation, 
that spoke to their condition as enslaved people and spoke to the idea that at some point in their history, God was going to lead them out of the house of bondage. <laughs>